What evidence will be a smoking gun when it comes to finding extraterrestrial life? Why is a Dyson sphere more realistic than a warp drive? Will North America ever adopt the metric system? And in our Q&A Plus edition, will China be collaborating with other nations in space? Answering all these questions and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are, across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Ross, what do you think it will take for the scientific community to be sufficiently confident to declare the discovery of life on another world? This is a tricky question. And this is this balance that I have to face as a person who is trying to communicate the work of scientists uh, when they're looking for life on on other planets. You know, we've had a long history of inconclusive results of the discovery of life just here in the solar system. Think back to Percival Lowell thinking that he'd seen canals on Mars. And people were talking about that and the discovery of life. Think about the Viking experiment that potentially detected the presence of of bacteria in the soil on Mars. Think about the discovery of methane in the atmosphere of Mars. Think about the discovery of phosphine at Venus. These are all claims the Mars meteorite. These are all claims Was that five in this last century. Um, these are all claims of life beyond Earth. And yet, once the initial claim is made, then people will question it study it and because it's inconclusive, then then people still haven't got a firm answer yes or no. But if there were trees on Mars, if there were creatures walking around on Mars, it would be incontrovertible. No one would question whether or not there's life on Mars. But the fact that it's not obvious tells us that if there is life on Mars, there isn't very much if there is life on Venus, there isn't very much. And it even extends into people seeing UFOs, UAPs that that the all of the images of UAPs are blurry at the very edge of the capability of the camera that was taking the picture of uh, eyewitness testimony hearsay, um, right, not just like absolute evidence. You remember that time when that giant spacecraft landed in the middle of Central Park, and everybody saw it and the aliens came out and we all talked to them about it. That would be no one would question it. No one it would just be absolutely incontrovertible. And so it's the finding the incontrovertible evidence. And there are versions of the search for life out there in the cosmos that are uh, incontrovertible that there will be no uncertainty that if we detect a signal in the radio waves coming directed at Earth, and it contains a pattern that does not match what the universe does, you know, binary code, something that matches the 21 centimeter line of hydrogen, something someone is trying to tell us prime numbers, then then you can know with certainty that this is an intelligent civilization that's on the other side. If we take James Webb and we point it at a planet, and we detect the presence of chlorofluorocarbons or other industrial chemicals, and that tells us tells us that there is life there that there is intelligent life that they are they are starting to pollute their environment. When we build the solar gravitational lens, and we look at another planet and we see a city on that planet, or we see a giant space station that's in the shape of a triangle orbiting around that planet. If we look out uh, to another star system, and we detect properly detect a Dyson swarm around it, or we look at a galaxy that has been reconfigured into a sphere and all the stars in that galaxy have been uh, surrounded by by Dyson swarms and the whole galaxy looks like a weird infrared signature that's in a funny shape that'll tell us that there's life out there in the cosmos. But so far, the kinds of detections that we're able to make are the ones that are at the very edge of the capabilities of the telescope. James Webb was able to detect the presence maybe of dimethyl sulfide, dimethyl disulfide in K218b, because this is the very limits of what James Webb is able to do. And a lot of people question whether or not the detection was even made. And even if they do, people question whether or not dimethyl sulfide requires life that you can in fact get these chemicals just in space itself, it's been found on comets that there are inorganic ways that you can make this kind of thing. So if there is something that is obvious, like a tree on Mars, then the scientific community will all agree and rally around it. And it will it won't take very long at all, right? An intelligent message coming from a, another civilization, everybody will be yep, done, finished life in the universe, nobody questions it. But the search will probably be more difficult. And so um, I wouldn't be surprised if we are 
50 years from now, you know, the the habitable worlds observatory has been launched, the large interferometer for exoplanets have been launched, they are examining planets around us, they are finding various trace gases with better and better resolution, the next generation telescopes are in the works right now, examining those planets that spacecraft are on their way out to the solar gravitational lens. Um, and we still won't have a conclusive answer for whether or not we are alone in the universe, that we will still be in this in between stage. That would not surprise me at all. That's the that's the outcome that I'm expecting. That is the that is the the way that I am reporting. And that is the way we're reporting on this for universe today, which is that we should be careful, we should be cautious, we should be skeptical, we should be hopeful. But we shouldn't get ahead of ourselves in declaring that life has been found. And I think that's the difference in the coverage that you're going to have from universe today compared to a lot of the other sites out there that are telling you that evidence for life found on K218b. So we need to be patient. It's going to take a while, I think. Kel Billman, science question, will North America ever switch to the metric system? Well, I don't know about the United States, but the rest of North America has. Canada, we're in the metric system. I was raised in the metric system. Now, because Canada is part of the Commonwealth and used to be part of the, the UK, and sort of shares the same lineage as the United States, uh, and the UK is imperial, mostly, um, we have a lot of that influence here in Canada. And so I was raised bilingual, I guess, um, metric and imperial in many of the ways, you know, our speed limits are measured in kilometers per hour, uh, the grocery store, we measure everything in grams, kilograms, but then you could buy apples for the pound. And many people know how far a mile is, even though we have no, we, we don't measure it at all here. The one that I had absolutely no understanding of was Fahrenheit. Uh, we just we always use Celsius in Canada for temperatures. And so, uh, you know, if you tell a Canadian that it is 80 degrees out, they have no idea what you're talking about. Um, I, you know, I, I now a little bit understand because my wife is American. And so she'll be like, Oh, the temperature is supposed to get up into the 70s today. And I'm, and I'm like, Okay, 70s, that's like, I don't know, 20 ish. I don't know. It's fine, right? It's good. 80s, hot. 90s, too hot. Uh, that's all I know. So, so no. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think it's the same with with Latin America. Uh, it's there's just the United States, and they are not North America. Canada is most of North America. We are the largest part of North America, and we are fully metric. It's time to shout out all the new five dollar patrons and above: Mingo Colasso, Sean West, Philip Green, Chris Tapscott. Bob Oblio, Matthew Britton, Tim N, Christopher Olson, Scott Lundberg, and John Miras. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. The Monk Dog. Why is the Dyson Sphere a rational thought experiment compared to faster than light travel since they are both wildly impossible, at least from where we stand today? Well, one violates the laws of physics, the faster than light drive as we understand it, and the other one doesn't. How would you travel faster than the speed of light? You would have to create a warp drive. You would have to find this negative matter, negative energy, negative mass. You'd need things that currently we're not sure are actually possible under the laws of physics. And so it's perfectly reasonable to expect that we will never be able to uh, create a faster than light transport system. And, and also, you know, if anyone ever did in the entire universe, then that would make interstellar travel, intergalactic travel easier to do, you would expect to find visitors from other star systems. And yet we don't find any evidence that anybody's is, is traveling across the galaxy to visit us, you know, in an infinite universe with warp drives, then there would be an infinite number of visitors to our planet. We don't see that. But a Dyson sphere, a Dyson swarm is just a satellite, a bunch of satellites orbiting around the sun collecting solar power. Well, we have that already, right? James Webb has solar panels on it that are collecting sunlight, and then they're putting them to use, you know, working as a telescope that we have now thousands of satellites that are in orbit around the Earth and other planets and just orbiting the sun itself that are collecting solar energy, and they are using them for their own various purposes. And that 
it's understandable that over time we will build more of them. That right now, let's say we have 8,000 parts of a Dyson Swarm and that we will build larger ones and we will build orbital colonies and we will build uh, various satellites. And eventually, right, when you look at a uh, an open grassland that you want to turn into a farm or a bunch of farms, bit by bit, you build more and more farms, more and more infrastructure. And eventually, what do you know, you have turned this entire lush garden, this lush valley into farms. And we it's entirely possible that we will do the same thing. And it won't happen overnight. We'll just turn back and go, ha, huh, what do you know, we ended up using all of the light coming from our star. And so it seems like an engineering impossibility from our current perspective here where we just we lack the infrastructure, lack the capability, lack an understanding. But I also think that that in the way that a city like when you look at Manhattan, you go, man, man can you imagine if someone sat down and said, I'm going to build a gigantic city with towers that are a 1000 feet tall. Uh, on this island on the side of the United States, like what would it take? That's beyond our comprehension. Well, it comes in build bits and pieces. People work on it here, people there, tear down buildings, put in better ones, replace the infrastructure that over time, humans trying to improve their lives, try to gain economic outcome can do incredible things. And so it doesn't seem to me that it like if you could just imagine exponential thinking, you could think of a future where we have built more satellites, and maybe we'll run out of material before we run out of sunlight. That's a possibility. Sure, absolutely. Or maybe we'll decide that we don't want to tear apart mercury that's too precious and special for us to turn into dice spheres. Sure, absolutely. We'll get to a 50% sphere and then we'll go that's enough. That's enough power. But that's never been the way humanity has thought that if you go all the way back to the beginning of human history, history, that more energy, it creates more society, more capability, and that we always want more. And it doesn't seem unreasonable that that our wanting more will continue on into the future. And it might not even be us, it might be our robot overlords that we have drilled into them as we train these large language models to always want more. And they're going to want to uh, tear apart the solar system and turn it into solar collecting satellites. So so I think that they are vastly different thought experiments. One violates the laws of physics as we understand it. Another is just an engineering challenge that we have not taken on yet today, but it feels like it's something that we will move towards in the future. The fact that we've already begun. Conspiracy theory enthusiast. There are light pollution filters for telescopes. Are there any glasses for sky viewing in light polluted areas? So one of the big problems of our modern society is light pollution that people have thought that it's a good idea to take their lights and point them up in the sky, where you waste energy and you cause harm to wildlife and you destroy our view of the Milky Way. Now, this is obviously a terrible idea. And this is something that we absolutely should not be doing. And it is easy, you know, this way's up, that way's down, point the lights down at the things that you want to illuminate, and you can cut back on the light pollution significantly. And, you know, if you live in a city, if you have any influence over the local politics of the place you live, please get involved, nag your city officials to stop wasting energy, stop wasting light, point those lights down, it is it is the right thing to do. A third of humanity can no longer see the Milky Way because of all of the light pollution that we have. But if you're an amateur astronomer, and you have, and especially if you're an astrophotographer, there are light pollution filters that you can put on your telescope that allow you to see stuff in the night sky even when there is a lot of light pollution in your area. And the capability of these light pollution filters is really amazing. Like there are people who are astrophotographers who live in the middle of Manhattan, and they point their telescope at the sky and they're producing beautiful images of nebulae and galaxies and clusters. And you wouldn't know if someone said, Oh, I'm, I live in the middle of Manhattan. They're like, how do you take a picture like this light pollution filters? So how do they work? Well, the various lights that we have will cast this glow into the sky and this reflects off of clouds and just off of small particles in the sky, the moon does this as well. But the light that is being illuminated is in very specific kinds of wavelength ranges. And so the way the light pollution filters work is that they will only let in a very specific wavelength of light. Often it's like measured down into the nanometers. And they generally correspond to very interesting things 
things that light does. So there are hydrogen alpha filters, there's sulfur filters, there's oxygen filters, and these match the wavelengths of light that are given off by those gases as they are moving out into the cosmos. And so when you are using a telescope that is equipped with light pollution filters, you may sort of put on the hydrogen alpha filter and then you will let in just a little bit of light through that one wavelength of light that you can then produce your image. And there is no light pollution that is being is causing this wavelength. And so the actual light from the nebula passes through and the pollution filter blocks all of this other light that's happening in the sky. But the downside is that they are very slow. In other words, that if you just go out to the perfect, most beautiful dark skies, Bortle one skies, and you take your telescope, and you view the sky with no light pollution, then you can gather really amazing images relatively quickly, because you're letting in all the light, all the wavelengths all at the same time, and then you're building up your images in that way. But if you're going to go to this place that's very light polluted, then you're going to only be able to let in a tiny fraction of the light, just one small wavelength range that then builds up your images. And so the people who are producing those images in places like Manhattan are observing for significantly longer. And the different light pollution filters that they can use let even less and less light. And so maybe one, you can produce an image with 100 hours of observing with your telescope. And then the other wavelength, you might need 200 hours to be able to view in that other wavelength. And then another one, you might need 400 hours, like notice, I'm saying hundreds of hours is how long people will be observing the night sky for. And this is the problem with your idea of like, could I just wear a pair of glasses? Our eyes are terrible cameras. And it's long exposures, which is what you need to be able to produce astronomical images. And so when you're looking at the sky, even in the beautiful dark Bortle one skies with your own eyeballs, uh, you know, your meat cameras are dumping the photons every few seconds, while to produce a long exposure image, you need to be collecting those photons for minutes, even hours. And so when you have that double whammy, you you're letting in much less light, just a fraction of the light that you would if you just had no light pollution filters on at all, matched with the fact that your eyeballs are dumping out photons, uh, light pollution filter of like light pollution glasses wouldn't let you see very much. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call it Q&A Plus. And this week's bonus question, will China collaborate with other nations in space exploration? And I'll put a link in the show notes. All right, those are all the questions that we had this episode. Thank you everyone for watching this episode, putting all of your questions into the YouTube comments, as well as everybody who joined me for the two hour live show that we record every Monday at 5pm somewhere in the world. So uh, if you're interested, I'll put a an event here on the channel that'll tell you when the next one of these recordings is going to happen. And if you're around, come and join us and ask your question. And you've got a good chance of getting it answered. Now I'm going to chat about a recent really important interview that I did. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew M. Grove, Sparely Grooving, Brian Body, Caredwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Bailock, Cy Nelson, David Gilton, and David Matz, Dustin Cable, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hunt Schultz, Hudson Moore, Jay Graves, James Clark, Jeremy Matter, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Marcel Smith, Michael Purcell, Mods Hill, Paul Robach, Rank Kaidu, Robeck, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fowler Munley, Vlad Shiplin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So I'm not sure if you saw this or you missed it, but I finally got a chance to interview somebody from the Vera Rubin Observatory. And of course, this is this incredible new observatory that's being built in Chile, the one with the 3.2 gigapixel camera that's going to be taking an image of the entire night sky every couple of nights. It's going to find millions of supernova asteroids. It's going to tell us everything the universe was doing when we weren't watching. And I was able to finally interview the director of Viruban went right to the top and talked to Edward Ajar. And this was an it was an incredible interview, we got a lot of insights about how things are going with Vera Rubin, how things should roll out in the coming 
months and what kinds of science outcomes we could be expecting. And so I just want to direct you at that interview in case you missed it the first time around. It's the one with Vera Rubin uh, on the thumbnail, but that's what this interview is about. And I think it's like one of the most important interviews that I've ever done. So hopefully, uh, if you enjoy interviews, you want to learn about this telescope, this is a great place to do it. All right, we'll see you next time.